Okay, what's going on, everyone? Um, so what follows is a conversation that I had a couple days ago uh, with John Meadows. And for those of you guys who don't know, uh, John is, in my opinion, one of the most highly sought after bodybuilding coaches that are out there. Um, and he has been for a long time. Um, he himself has competed over 60 times uh, in bodybuilding, and he's actually done 11 shows as a pro. And he has his certified strength and conditioning specialist degree or uh, certification. And he's coached hundreds, if not thousands, of bodybuilders um, from all around the world on the pro and the amateur level. And I really like his approach because he's just so open and honest, uh, really, about everything. And he also keeps a very open mind. Uh, in terms of new science that's coming out. And I really respect the fact that I think he's one of those rare and refreshing examples of a coach and, and a bodybuilder in the mainstream who really does keep themselves open to, to scientific evidence. Just a few quick things to note. Uh, this was basically a raw, unscripted conversation that I had with John. Um, so this should probably be seen more so as just us kind of having a chat rather than a scripted Q&A interview per se. Um, and we do talk quite openly about anabolic steroids in this interview uh, or in this conversation. Um, and I've voiced my personal opinion on the channel a few times about steroids. And I'll just basically link a couple of videos in the cards up here uh, if you'd like to check those out um, after this. Um, but I basically wanted uh, John to more or less have the floor in this one, uh, as someone who has a ton of experience on this front. And uh, I really appreciated and, respect, uh, and respected um, his basically just no bullshit, very upfront approach to communication on this topic. Um, so I really hope that you guys do as well. Um, and just as a note, uh, the recording does like glitch out, I think about partway through the interview. Uh, for some reason, my recording software uh, decided to freeze on my face. Um, so I have the exact same facial expression uh, for about 10 or 15 minutes about partway through. Uh, other than that, there is a little bit of static in, in the background noise uh, throughout the, the interview. Um, so just be aware of that. I'm still basically trying to figure out how it is I can record these um, over Skype in a way that, that sounds as crisp as possible. Um, or maybe I may have to start doing more in-person interviews. Um, but anyway, my goal is to improve the audio uh, for these in, f in the future. Um, and I'd appreciate if you guys just basically bear with me uh, in the meantime. Um, there will be timestamps in the description box if you'd like to, to jump around a little bit. And I'm going to be releasing this on my podcast uh, as soon as I get the design work back from my, my graphic designer. Uh, I'm basically rebranding my podcast as the Jeff Nippard podcast. Um, so once I have that all ready to go, uh, I'll release that over there. And you can check that out in the description box once that, once that goes up. Um, and yeah, please leave us a like on this video. Uh, we'd really appreciate that. Uh, John was very generous with his time on a uh, Friday night, actually, to record this with me. Um, so show your appreciation for his time as well. Um, and yeah, just hit the thumbs up button. It'd be very much appreciated. And without further ado, here is my interview with the mountain dog, John Meadows. All right, everyone. So I'm here with John Meadows. And uh, John, I just want to say thanks for coming on the channel and coming on the podcast. It's really nice to have you here, man. Well, you bet. You you are doing some awesome work, man. So the pleasure is all mine. Sweet. Um, yeah, and I think uh, some of our listeners might be a, a little maybe surprised by this this collaboration, um, but I think that uh, it's something that a lot of people will benefit from uh, with with your uh, very extensive experience as both a, a bodybuilder and a coach. Um, so I have a ton of respect for your work. Um, for anyone out there who maybe isn't familiar, maybe you could just uh, give a give us a quick primer on in your background as a coach and as a bodybuilder yeah well man i got started real early uh when i was 12 years old i actually competed the first time when i was 13 years old so i've been pretty obsessed with um hypertrophy my whole life i mean i always wanted to be a bodybuilder i i did some stints in powerlifting at west side barbell which i thoroughly enjoyed but you know i started competing very young i um to this point in my career i've done over 60 contests I did, um, I've done 11 shows as a pro. I placed in five of them. Um, but I've always been interested in how do you make things better? Um, you know, just because something's working doesn't mean it can't be better. So, you know, I got my, back in the day, I got my uh, CSCS and I got my cert certification from Jose Antonio's group. And, and I've always, I've always just felt like, 
no matter how much I know, there's just so much more out there to learn. So I feel like I've been a coach forever and I don't feel like I know everything. I feel like there's still a lot to be learned and um, I'm just as excited about bodybuilding now, I, I think, as I've ever been from purely from the perspective of just muscle building, you know. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. That's I, awesome. I, I didn't realize that you did your first show at 13 years old. That's that's crazy. Yeah, <laughs> I was a little insane. I, I remember I was in track at the same time and I remember I would uh, train my legs and then I was a sprinter. I had to run the 100 and 200 and it didn't mix very well doing the same workouts in the same days. So. so if you were on stage at 13, you must have started weightlifting when you were, what, 12 or did you just hop right on stage right away? Oh, when I was 12, I started training. Um, I've actually got some pictures of when I was 13 and I competed. I was 119 pounds. <laughs> but um, in 1985, I, I watched – see, the Mr. Olympia used to be on ESPN. And in 1985, I watched the Mr. Olympia. And, of course, Lee Haney to me will always be um, just, just fantastic guy and a fantastic champion. So I always loved Lee Haney and I always appreciated Tom Platts. He, uh, he had um, an intensity to this day that's probably not been replicated. And, and he was also very scientific in his approach. You know, he did some collaborations with Fred Hatfield, just as an example. But he was – I went to his um, seminars when I was a teenager. I went to several of them, and he was incredibly articulate. He understood training at a very deep level, um, and I was just obsessed with it by that point. I, You know, I, I knew all the hamstring and forearm muscles when I was probably 16, 17 years old. So those were the two that I really liked. They really got me into it just right out of the gate. Gotcha. Um and you've obviously developed this into like a career and a, a business for yourself. Have you found that in doing that, has it taken away any of your passion or has it tainted it in any way? You said you're just as gung-ho as you always were. That's something that I get asked a lot as someone who's now like turning this into basically a profession. It's like sometimes people will say once you start doing it professionally, it takes, it takes some of the joy out of it. Have you found that at all? Well, okay, so sometimes it gets – sometimes I just want to train and I don't want to film. I don't want to video. But I, um, but I do video. I'm very active on Instagram and, and YouTube. So um, at this point in my career, that's a marketing department for me, and it's a tool to educate people and just to share. Just, there's some times that I just want to just get away from social media and just train, but not because I dislike social media. I just I don't like any distractions. But in terms of actually training, um. I still love it, man. I mean, I still I still never miss a workout. I couldn't tell you the last time I missed a workout. And um, I don't anticipate on that changing anytime soon. I mean, it's been, what, 30-some years now. So <laughs> That's awesome, man. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm sure a lot of people are really going to look up to that. I find it really inspiring myself. Um, so I guess the first thing I, we could start out with here, I, I wanted, I think, most of our conversation to be focused around around training. Um, I've had a few a few friends who've ran through some of your programs or, or tried to anyway, and they sound pretty intense, pretty ingru pretty grueling to me. Um, how how would you describe your general training philosophy, the Mountain Dog training philosophy? Well, it's it's very methodical for one. It it may seem like everything is um, a little crazy, but there's a reasoning behind everything I do. I have what I call base workouts, and I have pump workouts, and um, the strategy itself that I use has just evolved over a long period of time. I didn't just wake up one day and go, huh, I'm just going to throw a training program together and think of a name and sell it. Um, some of the roots, you know, I, a lot of it is rooted in longevity, too. When I was in my 20s, it seemed like I was constantly getting injured, almost I almost tore my pecs, I'm going to say probably 40, 50 times, constant strains. And I was always doing compound movements first. So eventually, after many, many years, I realized, you know what, that might not be the best thing for me. So I moved the compound movement into a different part of the workout, either the second or third exercise. And, you know, as you get older, you start to realize how important activation is. And I thought, you know, when I go to those compound movements, you know, for me as a bodybuilder, not a powerlifter, I'm trying to use them for hypertrophy. So the better I can get at activating the muscle before I even get to it, the better off I'll be. So, you know, I have a, a phase where I really work for activation at the beginning, and then we plow the compound movements and we work hard 
I try to train compound movements with a fair amount of speed. I'm a big believer that uh, you should apply as much force to the bar as you can. And, you know, for, you know, for to hit the maximum amount of muscle fibers. And then, you know, you kind of got this old school thing, too, with the pump. And I've always felt like the, the really exhausting, and this is probably the stuff that your friends were talking about, the, the drop sets, the ISO holds, all that. I feel like that has a place in your workouts. Now, I only do that for one set. And some people see a video of me doing it, and they're like, oh, my God, you're going to overtrain. Right. They think I'm like, that's my whole workout. Yeah. But the reality is it's one set of the third exercise. And, of course, now Brad Schoenfeld and all these folks are talking about cellular swelling and all this stuff. And that's essentially what I'm trying to accomplish. And then one of the things I've always felt that was really great was once you pump a muscle up to stretch it really hard, use a movement that really elongates the muscle belly, put a hard stretch on it. And um, I never really knew why I, when I was younger doing that. I just it just something felt right about it. You know, you could I guess you could talk about IGF one and I guess you could talk about uh, four range of motion, all those things. But to me, it just felt like it worked. Mm. So I structure those base workouts in phases and I feel like I'm getting the best of both worlds. I feel like I'm getting, um, you know, the stuff that the, the, the tension, the mechanical tension that drives muscle growth. I feel like I'm getting the metabolic stress that drives muscle growth. Um, and you know, that is like the meat. Those are the base workouts. And then the second workout, I come back again later in the week and I just drop out that phase two, the compound stuff. So like if you were training chest, for example, I wouldn't let you do the barbell movements second. Um, I feel like that's a recipe for disaster over the long term on your joints, your connective tissue, your ligaments and all that stuff. And when I really started figuring that part out is what that's one of the major things I can say to help my longevity. I, you know, I don't think that training a muscle group once a week, um, it, it, it worked initially, but man, it quit working. Mm -hmm. And I can take you through kind of why my frequencies change and all that. But I feel like, um, that's a way, that's a way for me to increase or anybody to increase their frequency without tearing herself up in the process. Mm -hmm. So I guess my point is, is there's, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, I don't think many people have really looked at exercise sequencing, and that's one of the biggest things that I've done. And for about seven years now, I've, I've had a real steady plan with sequencing and just how some things flow better into the other. Gotcha. Yeah, that's interesting. It's kind of it's kind of a loaded question. It's like if someone asked me to describe my general training philosophy, I'd be like, where do I begin? There's just so much uh, so much yeah. to get into, right? Um, but that that gives us, I think, a pretty good picture of of what it is you're talking about. Um, so when you talk about exercise sequencing, could you go into a little bit more detail about that? So like you mentioned doing some kind of like activation exercise first. So I guess that would be like, you know, if we just take like the back, for example, would that be like um, some kind of isolation movement, like a pullover or something like that? And then you'd get into like heavy rowing next or what, what would that look like in See, practice? Here, okay. Oh, man, I love talking about this stuff. So the pullover <laughs> to me is more of a stretch exercise. Okay. So it would be any kind of a pull down or a row to me, probably more of a row. You know, where you're you're using very strict form, you're keeping your elbow at your side, If you, you know, I guess if you're targeting your lats. But, you know, for a chest, it might be a dumbbell press. It's not an isolation movement. Okay. It's, it's just a movement to get – I want to get blood moving in the muscle. I want to get the, you know, the right muscle activated, and I want to start delivering nutrients to the muscle. So it's not necessarily an isolation movement. And a lot of those isolation movements, like for chest, the fly, for example – I consider that a stretch exercise. That would go on the bottom end of my workout. Okay. Um, another example would be like a stiff-legged deadlift for your hamstrings. That's going to go on the bottom of my workout. Gotcha. Um, a pullover for your back is a really good exercise. Stretch your lats. Um, that would be another one that would go to a part of the workout where I'm really stretching it. So it's not necessarily an isolation movement. It's just a movement where you can control the weight, like a dumbbell or a machine. Mm -hmm. Machine presses for chest where you can really squeeze, or a dumbbell where you can really squeeze. Um, that's that's what I, that's my thought process. Gotcha. Um, and you found that getting, I guess, like the blood flowing and kind of like targeting those muscles then allows you to sort of feel those muscles better and activate them better in the later exercises. Is that the the basic theory behind it, or is it more it, of an injury prevention thing? It's both. It's 50-50. Right. Gotcha. It's 50-50. It, since I started using that philosophy many, many years ago, I never had another pec injury. 
Um, and what happens is people get a little bit, it's, they're not used to it at first, so they get a little fatigued. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And they think, oh, I'm weaker. Yeah. It's not weakness. It's just fatigue. It's just because you've done something else. Right. But if you stick with it, your strength comes back, and then it gets even better. Um, you know, I've I what I would say ninety percent of people find, unless they go absolutely nuts on the first exercise, is that the, it doesn't really. Uh, I'm sorry, I thought I had no it turned off. That's all good. I thought I had it turned off. No sweat. Um, but what people find is that if they just stick with it, their strength comes back, and it's even better. Mm. You know. Um, but that is a common thing that people say, well, well, isn't it going to affect the strength on my compound exercise? I'm like, well, yeah, it might increase your strength initially, but it's also um, just fatigue. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean the muscles aren't working hard. Yeah. And if your goal is hypertrophy, which mine is, then it's going to help you achieve your goal. And it's not that I don't want you to use heavy weight either. Don't get me wrong. If I say a set of six... I want you using as much weight as you possibly can with perfect form for your six. The other thing I would say over the years, Jeff, that I've been um, pretty adamant about is using perfect form on compound movements and just being a part of the powerlifting world and things like that. Those things have a potential to really tear, tear you up. So when I'm using, you know, an inclined bench press or a squat or something, I want to see perfect ex- execution. And it's not that I advocate doing light training. I just want you to use good form. So if I say do a set of eight, we're going to work up until you can just barely get eight with perfect form. Mm-hmm. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, no, I like it. I, I think um, how I would think of it in terms of like the fatigue that you see initially is almost like taking one step backwards. You can take two forward sort of thing um, because initially, yeah, you're, if you're adding another exercise in before what you're used to doing first, um, you'll be a little bit weaker on that initially, but it's basically just creating a new starting point for you and now you right. can build your way back up, right? Right. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then I also really like the, the big picture long-term approach in terms of longevity because – Powerlifting, obviously, like you said, you know, has, has caught in a lot of popularity recently, especially in the natural bodybuilding community. And you do see a lot of people come in and they just go, boom, right to their deadlift, right to their squat or what have you. Um, I don't know if this correlates well with any kind of increase in injury or anything like that. But from my own experience, I feel like something like what you're talking about makes makes a lot of sense. And if you've been able to train as long as you have doing that approach, I think... It, it, my hat's off to you, you know, because a lot of people in the sport do get really banged up. Um, yeah. So, well, I've, you know, I've worked with a lot of banged up people. I think it was about four years ago I started working with Mark Dugdale, and he was on the verge of retiring because he was so beat up from hit training. Yeah. He had torn hamstring, torn pec, torn quad. And Mark, two years ago, won three pro shows. He won one. I mean, he's went on a a winning streak and you know he's one of many guys that i've trained that they thought their careers were their bodies were just too beat up but the system allowed them to you know i started working with Fwad and he had some some injuries and Fwad was able to win a couple shows and um he's had some injuries since but um i think um it's always smart to think long term you know i know it's i've been there you know i was the guy jeff that i remember when i was when I was 20, I was 21 at the time, going to World Gym, and um, I was actually squatting um, probably around 550 or 600 back then. And I remember the squats, there were five squat racks in the back. And I remember the old powerlifters were on them on Saturday mornings, and I was on them Saturday mornings. Every Saturday morning, Friday night, you'd start getting excited. You'd start getting pumped up. You just couldn't wait to get in there on Saturday. And I remember going in there on Saturdays, and these guys were putting all their old man cream on and their wraps and their knee wraps. And I remember kind of like laughing at those guys. And like, the only reason you guys are all hurt is because you don't train right. You have awful form. And I got a little older and I realized, holy crap, you just get beat up. It's just the fact of training hard. If you train with intensity, it's just, it, 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 you're going to get aches and pain and pain and strains and all those things. So you're probably better. You're probably wise to be really careful and, you know, to try to stay in one piece. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I, I, w- I want to get a little bit of a clearer picture about how, how your exercise sequencing goes. So you'd start off with your, your activator. 
Um, is this like lightweight, higher rep stuff, like a, a really like kind of constant tension type movement? So like say a machine press for the chest. Um, what kind of like rep zone are you working in there? And are you going any bit like a medium, medium? weight okay. or like an eight, eight to 10. Okay. And then um, how close to failure? Close to eight. How close? What to I failure? typically do is I'll work my way up and the last set will be the one that's to failure. Okay. So, um, let's say like for a machine press, for example, like let's say I do, you know, say four warm ups, or me, I do like 10 warm ups. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. let's say the machine has like 250 pounds. Let's say that I can do the machine for a maximum of eight times. I might do 200 for eight, 210 for eight, 225 for eight, and then 250 for eight. Now, obviously, the 200, those, those preceding sets obviously weren't the failure. But I consider those working sets. It's not like you didn't do anything. It's not like you didn't challenge the muscle at all. But then the last set, I prefer to really be to true failure with good form. So I'm not going to get up to that weight and stay there set after set after set. One of the interesting concepts now, and um, you did a video on it, is you know how often should you come? How often should you train to failure? Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm not big on taking every set to failure, and I've just always felt like that's probably done a little bit more than you need you're probably doing a little bit more damage than you need to so to answer your question i'm going to work up and i'm going to count a few of those sets as volume that aren't the failure and then the last one should be the failure gotcha gotcha um and then after that do you get into your, like a main some kind of main movement or what comes yes. after the activator compound movement gotcha gotcha so for chest like my favorite exercise is a slide incline barbell bench press as an okay. example gotcha and depending on what the exercise is, the rep range is now they're going to drop a little bit. So now you're looking at maybe a, a five, a six, or a seven reps, right. generally probably around six reps. What I'm trying to do there, Jeff, is I'm trying to get people up to somewhere around 85% of their max right. uh, for as many reps as they can get. Some people can get six with that. Some people can get five with that. Just in that ballpark, I feel like if you get to that level of intensity as relates as it relates to a one rep maximum, you can feel pretty good about hitting those high threshold motor units, you know, with the weight being that heavy. Yeah. And as I mentioned earlier, I like to really apply a lot of force to the bar. So if it's a squat, I'm purposely trying to drive up as fast as I can. If it's a bench press, I'm trying to push as hard as I can. Um, I kind of like have a sprinter mentality, like force, you know, just explode. Um, so that's kind of how that one looks. Gotcha. Yeah, I think that also that whole speed component really ties in nicely with the the safety and longevity idea because um, I'm aware of some research showing that um, if you move a weight at say like say it's a lesser the, the weight is actually lower, uh, but if you move that at a really fast velocity, you can stimulate a, a very similar number of motor units as you would with a much heavier weight um, or, or something that yeah. it basically makes up for lighter loads. So if you can handle lighter loads, it's less stress on your joints and your soft tissues. Just move it a lot faster and you just might move get a similar hypertrophic effect, right? Right, right. Yeah. Well, yeah. then, you know, when you, you get into rate coding, all that stuff. But um, yeah, 100 percent, man. Plus, it's fun. It's just yeah, fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So after this, um, is that when you'd hop into like some kind of stretcher movement or is there a little more fluff in there? A pumper. Like I call okay. this. The, so the. The, the, the third phase is what I call the super max pump phase. And all that means is just I'm going to pump the muscle as much as I can. I literally want to get as – I want as much cell swelling as I can possibly get. Gotcha. So that's going to be an exercise that allows me to do that. And then the fourth set is always going to be the one where I apply the high-intensity technique. So it might be a drop set or it might be – it might be a bunch of uh, accentuated negatives. Like I might say – you know, have an exercise where you can just apply a little extra manual resistance on the eccentric part. It might be um, a, an ISO hold at the end of it. might be partials. All those different things that you can extend the set, create lactate and all that fun stuff. But that's the third phase. Gotcha, gotcha. And then after that, you'll do your, your stretcher to finish. Something that just stretches the hell out of the yeah. muscle. Yeah, it feels yeah. so good at that point in the workout too. And yeah. You know, I've never seen anybody get injured doing it at that point. I feel like I feel like it's very beneficial at that point. Gotcha. Yeah, I really I really like that that setup. Um, and then you would run that through a couple times a week for each each body part, or does that depend? One time for each body part, and then the second time I take out that phase too. Gotcha. 
Okay. So you don't beat yourself up with the heavy compound stuff. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, that that's a that's a really that's a really solid setup um, to me. And I think you're right. What a lot of people tend to really gravitate to is like the hardcore bloody stuff, which is like those <laughs> drop sets and everything. But that's just a small portion of, yeah. of what you're actually doing. Um, yeah. So thanks for sharing that uh, with us, John. Um, one thing I, I wanted to talk to you about is. Uh, genetic limitation. Um, so as someone who's been doing this for a really, really long time, um, I would imagine you'd have uh, some pretty good insight into this. Um, so do you have any strategies for helping people break back or break past what might be a perceived genetic limitation? Well, I, okay, so if they didn't pick the right parents, you know what? i tell you what, though, Jeff, one of the things that I'm a firm believer in is People don't know what they're capable of, man, until someone pushes them to that level. And I've had so many people, you know, I have pros come here all the time and they'll do a, they'll do a workout and they'll say, I didn't even know I was capable of that. Mm-hmm. You know, and these are people that have trained hard their whole life. And I think people just aren't aware, number one, of what they're even capable of. So I think the majority of people who think they're at their genetic limit I don't think they've really pushed themselves to even be able to say they're at their genetic limit. But let's let's say they're close or something like that. So, you know, then you've got a whole lot of things you got to look at. You got to look at their nutrition. Um, I personally am a big believer in what you put in your body around train around the training window. I know that's very controversial, but um, and then you get people that you got to look at their training program. So. What all have they really tried? Like if somebody comes to me, what I always found crazy was, you know, you'll get people to come to you and they'll say like, well, my legs won't grow. And you'll give them, you know, you'll prescribe some workouts for them. And they'll say, well, I don't, I don't, I don't do that. I like to do this. Mm-hmm. Like, Wait a minute. You just told me your legs don't grow from that. <laughs> so, you know, so you, people, they get, in, they get like ingrained these ideas in their head and they won't change anything. And I'm not married to any idea. If I learned that my system was horrible and there was a better way to do it tomorrow, I would abandon ship and I would adopt a new philosophy. Mm-hmm. But um, I think one of the hard things with people was they're just so – first of all, you got to get them to try something new. Then you got to look at – you got to do a history with them. Okay, what have you done? Because all those things that you've done that didn't work, we have to do something totally different. And it, it might be the intensity of the workout. It might be the volume of their workout. It could be – I mean, there's a number of things. It could be the training frequency, but there are a lot of variables that you can manipulate over time. And for someone to tell me that their genetic limit, they better have tried all that stuff for many, many years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot of rocks to unturn before you can truly say, I was stuck at 210 pounds competing for 10 years when I was convinced I was at my genetic limit, but I was wrong. Mm-hmm. And um, so there's a lot of rocks you gotta you got to turn over there. Gotcha. Looking at their gotcha. pitch. So you mentioned... Uh, you know, people would come in and say they're, they didn't even know they were capable of doing that. Um, so basically, like, you just have to push yourself harder. How do you how do you do that without, you know, compromising what we've talked about, about training to failure and so on? Like, if you're only taking one set to failure uh, and it's your last one, how do you how do you kind of do that? How do you how do you push yourself harder in that in those confines? Well, the best thing to have is, is to have an awesome training partner. Yeah, um, I've been fortunate to have some really good training partners. I don't know if you've seen all the videos with Dave Tate and I have a man, but we used to just kill each other. But to do it intelligently, you know, you've got to look at a few things. You know, one of the biggest uh, misnomers that I grew up with was thinking you had to be really, really sore in order to have a productive workout. In order to grow, you had to be super sore. And the more sore you were, the better. I was completely wrong about that. And... I feel like there is a point of no return where you beat your body up so bad. You know when you, people tell you like they can't walk for five days, they can't sit down, their legs hurt so bad. That's overboard to me. So if you're going, if you're working that failure set really hard and you're that sore, you probably went a little too far. So you probably got to scale it back. And then in terms of just in general, not acute but chronically, if you're doing these sets over and over, you just got to look for the classic symptoms with people. You know. Um, People tend to, their performance decreases. You know, maybe their peak power goes down. Maybe their endurance goes down. Um, You know, maybe they are more moody. You know, I see people like all of a sudden they get moody when they're a little overtrained. Or um, So you got to kind of be wary of all the traditional uh, overtraining symptoms. I look at a lot of, I look at the performance part probably more than most people. 
I look at the speed in which they're training. Like those compound movements, if all of a sudden that 315 used to fly up, if all of a sudden it's going really slow, that's a like a bell goes off. I'm like, okay, we got to look at this. Um, so speed, you know, people don't get pumps anymore. Maybe their insulin sensitivity is kind of all out of whack. But those are the same things you would look for overtraining are kind of the same things you look for here. And when you find those things, sometimes you just have to pull back. Um, you know, how do you pull back? That's a whole other story. Um, you know, is it something where you need a deload or if you just need to maybe just maybe not a deload, but maybe you just need to adjust the intensity of that one set. It might just be as simple as that. You know, does that make sense? Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. Um, I think that's something that I, I kind of advise people if they're like, I'm stuck at a plateau. What do I do? And then I'm like, well, how beat up do you feel? And if they're like really, really beat up, I'm like, well, you probably need to do a little less. And then yeah. if they're like, no, I'm not beat up at all. It's like, okay, you need to, you need to push yourself a little more. Uh, you need to do a little right. more, right? Um, so, yeah. so that's kind of the way I think to solve that. Um, yeah. And I, yeah, I totally agree. Um, how about we, we bring the, the steroids card into play here? What do you think um, about people who are, are natural and feel like they haven't really made a whole lot of progress is that is it a different story for someone who who has anabolics on their side? Hundred percent. Yeah. Hundred percent. I mean, you're jacking protein th- synthesis up so much. You're reducing muscle protein breakdown so much. It's a different ball game. Um, and if anybody tells you differently, then they must have had fake fake gear. Mm. <laughs> so um, it is a different ball game. You're capable. Your recovery is much different. Um, the interesting thing, Jeff, though, is I'll tell you what, I've always kept about, you know, if, if I look back at the number of people I have, probably half were natural and half weren't. So I've always had a good population that was natural. And one of the things I found was that there were natural athletes that were very gifted that recovered really fast. And there were also people who were not natural taking, you know, a fair amount of stuff that still couldn't recover. So I think there's a genetic card in here for recovery and I don't really understand it I don't really understand the science of how somebody can recover genetically uh, really well and somebody who has all these extra advantages can't but those are not the exception to the rule you know there's there's there are people like that but they're they're the exception the majority of people you know if they're using insulin and growth hormone and steroids they're going to recover 10 times faster um, and, and this is what has ruined methodology in bodybuilding, Jeff, because people have awful programs, but they take so many drugs, they just assume their programs are awesome. Mm-hmm. And then they tell everybody else, you need to do these programs. You know, yeah. that's what happens. There's nobody that really in bodybuilding, well, I don't want to say nobody, there's not too many people that have been able to think outside of drugs. And this is one of the reasons why I've always liked having natural people because you can't, it's not one for one. You have to think a little differently. I yeah. personally think natural people need a little less volume. Mm. I think people who are enhanced can handle more volume. And more volume, as you know, can create more muscle. Yeah. But you got to be a little bit smarter about it when you're natural. Um, and then also, obviously, the drugs push people that are natural past their natural plateau. Um, I don't think I ever could have reached pro status natural. Just no way. There's just no way. So you can get, I think, you can develop an awesome physique naturally. But... Um, just for someone to say, oh, you can be a pro, you can be a pro bodybuilder, you can be 250 pounds, eh, that's hard to believe. But the, the, the guys with the help are definitely recovering faster. Um, again, that 13 pounds is definitely tilted in their favor. Hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, it's a different ballgame for sure. Um, in the context of breaking through weak points, do you think it would be fair to say that like someone who – is enhanced or at least open to being enhanced you could just always say just up the dose is that something that you you recommend or do you think it's more, uh, more still smart to just focus more on your training just like a, you know a natural guy would yeah man i when i have somebody with a weak part the first thing that comes into my mind is how is their exercise most people just say more frequency mm-hmm. just train it more often but if what they're doing if they're not executing the exercises properly just doing it wrong more often isn't going to help the first thing I like to do if someone says, well, my chest won't grow, I'm going to watch them train their chest. Is their sternum caving in or they, is all the stress transferring to their delts and their triceps or are there some mechanical, are there some things they're doing wrong with their form that you can fix? That's the number one thing that comes into my head. Um, if all those things, if your form is great, everything looks great, the tension's right, 
and then and the recovery is right, then maybe you can look at adding frequency. But um, usually upping the dose isn't necessarily a way to fix a weak body part. Um, you know, it might make your whole body grow, but it's not going to selectively, like if you have poor legs, it's not going to all of a sudden make your legs grow and you're not in your upper body not grow. Um, I'm not a big fan of the up the dose, just to be honest with you. I mean, I've been a low to moderate guy my whole life. I would, I, I constantly post posted blood work. I post blood pressure all the time. I posted it yesterday or maybe even today. Um, and I'm going to turn 46 in April and I'm still doing really good. So I think that kind of backs up what I've been saying for many, many years. Mm. Um, so yeah, on that note, I guess, um, now would be a good time to talk about, uh, some of the, the health effects, especially in light of, of recent events in the bodybuilding community. There's been a huge backlash against steroids and how, you know, the bodies are turning up. Um, Rich Piana passed away, Dallas McCarver passed away at a really young age. Um, how much of this do you think is attributable to, to steroid use and has the public caught the, the wrong idea here? Well, man, um, the thing is the body isn't meant to have 300 pounds of muscle. I mean, I hear a lot of people say, well, I'm healthy, you know, it's muscle. But if you think about the stress on your heart, I would almost rather someone be, have more fat, you know, it doesn't require the blood supply that muscle does. So when, when your body weight gets really high for your height, then you're asking a lot of your heart. And if you have some genetic issues in your family, like Dallas did, it's really rolling the dice. I've got genetic issues in my family. Um, and um, I'm actually getting a calcium score test done next Thursday um, just to see if I have plaque buildup and things like that. Um, there is a backlash and there should be a backlash. Um, it's just amazing what I hear first, even first timers doing. I mean, you've got these drug gurus out there that put people on right out of the gate, 750,000 milligrams of test, you know, all this other stuff on top of it. And look, I'm of the opinion people can do whatever they want, you know, but I'm also of the opinion people should be educated to know what they're getting themselves into. And, you know, you can take most people, you know, my off seasons for the last probably six years have been straight HRT. And I've had many, many people do the same, and they did really well. If you if you really focus on diet and nutri- on nutrition and training, you can get by on such a smaller amount. It's unbelievable. People never believe it until they try it, and then it actually works for them. Then they're like, "Wow, you were right. I can just take 500 megs of tests and not 1500." You know. So again, I don't. You know, people can do what they want. I'm not the kind of guy that says you know, shame on you. You can do what you want. It's your life. But I think people should understand that a lot of the coaching and information out there is just way, way overboard on that part. Hmm. Interesting. Um, so just for, for sort of curiosity, it, when you say you bring the dose way down then in the off season, does that result in muscle loss or do you just compensate that f- for that by eating more calories so that you can continue to make progress? Or do you actually shrink up and then grow in to the show? Well, there's a couple different approaches. Um, one of the approaches is is you got the old Kevin Lavroni approach where you just shrink up. And if you can respond to D-ball like he can, then you can blow right back up. I, You know what I used to teach my guys in the offseason? Um, after they would do their PCT or HRT, um, if, if I felt like they could bring their, PC, their hormones back, I'd put them on PCT, you know, some Clomid, ACG, things like that. But if you don't feel like they can get their natural hormones back, then you go down to an HRT, a legit HRT dose. You got to do that for a long time. But then what I used to tell my guys was, let's find the absolute lowest amount we can take and still make progress in the off season. And for many guys, it was 400 megs of test, maybe 200 megs of something else, DECA or EQ. Certainly much lower than what they call blasting these days. Everybody likes to use the term blasting now. Um, but I used to like have my guys use the lowest amount that they could use and still do well in cycles. And then, you know, maybe 12 weeks of that, and then maybe you come back and you do another PCT or you drop down a, a true HRT dose. And the nice thing there is when it comes pre-contest time, that's when you do have to ramp it up to, to look like a pro bodybuilder. You have to take more. And 
it's not so much high doses of one compound. It's now you got to work some other compounds in that give your muscles a cosmetic look. And the nice thing is now all of a sudden your body will react really well to that stuff mm. um, because you weren't pounding it all, all year round. You know, when you pound stuff year round, I've, I've been around a long time, Jeff. I've seen a lot of people come and go, mm. superstars. And then, the, man, where'd this guy come from? Two years later, poof, they're gone. Yeah. You know, these guys, they jam it in the off season. They're grams and grams and grams. And their body finally just says, all right, man, that's, that's the best I got, you know. Um, and I think the approach that I have is also certainly much less risky. I'm never going to say with no risk. It's always risky. But um, it's nice to be able to respond to things when you're dieting. Dieting itself, is it's hard enough to maintain your muscle, right, when you're dieting. I mean, that's hard. Mm-hmm. So, you know, now you can actually ramp some of the stuff up close to a contest and, main, and protect your muscle a little better. Right. Um, just because this is something that I, I very infrequently will talk about on the channel uh, or the podcast, um, just keep everyone up to speed. When you say uh, HRT, that's hormone replacement therapy. So that's sort of like low do- dose testosterone, right? Um, yeah. yeah. And then when you say uh, PCT, post cycle therapy, um, so maybe you could just briefly go into what that means in case anyone is is unfamiliar with that term and why that may be important, and then we can uh, move on to some new stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, when you when you take a lot of gear, when you're taking a lot of steroids, your own body, um, you know, will stop producing testosterone, and that's a problem if you want to have kids or things of that nature. Um, and the more cycles you do, the more years you do the higher the likelihood of you shutting it down permanently. It gets shut down permanently. Um, when that happens, you have to take testosterone. You have to take HRT, which would be a low dose of testosterone, maybe 150, 200 megs of testosterone a week. Now, if you're fortunate enough that you haven't shut your own body down, there are compounds that can get your own natural testosterone, testosterone production, LH, FSH, all that stuff back to normal, you know, things like HCG and Clomid and Novadex. And so, you know, if somebody is kind of beyond that point, they're going to have to do HRT the rest of their life. Um, I have to do HRT personally. I tried to bring my, I, I tried the last time, um, I tried to see if I could bring everything back naturally. Um, it was 2002 and it didn't work. So I've had to take HRT ever since. Um, but, Eventually, the longer you do this stuff, it'll shut you down. So if someone's considering doing this stuff, you really got to think about it. You know, it can impact your ability to have kids. It can put you on a medication the rest of your life. You know, there's definitely some implications with doing that. Right. Um, Yeah, I mean, as a a professional natural bodybuilder myself, I guess I've always preached sort of that mentality on the channel. Um, I think for one thing, like you sort of said earlier, it, it almost simplifies things in a way. It's like you have these two variables, training, nutrition, and you've just got to optimize those and that's the best you can do with the genetics you have. Um, I feel like steroids involves this huge third variable that just opens up a whole another can of worms and almost it almost turns it into to something different in a, in a way for me. It becomes oh, it a is. lot more about the chemistry yeah. um, than it is. anything. 100%, man. It's 100%. Man, I I love talking about training nutrition, but man, it drives me nuts talking about the chemicals because then all of a sudden the training and nutrition just aren't quite as important to people, and it should be. That mm-hmm. should be number right. one. Yeah, yeah, that that's what I was curious about because for say just take me for example, um, as someone who who's been training, I've been training now for about eleven years, and it, it, it can be discouraging sometimes. You know, like for the last. I'd say four or five years, I've basically been between this like same range of, of body weight, really, right? Um, and I, I will improve. I will see improvements in my physique. Like I might bring up my traps a little bit, bring up my biceps a little bit. But when it comes time to, to, sh- to shred down for the stage, I, I'm looking at, you know, roughly the same stage weight I find uh, at this point. You can look a little bit harder. Maybe the skin's a little bit tighter, but you're, you're kind of looking at a very similar mass of muscle. Um, so when I asked you about, you know, that that weak point thing, it was kind of like, uh, would your advice be be different for someone who's a natural than someone who who has uh, all of the the extra stuff at their at their disposal? Um, yeah. Yeah. And I guess the answer is is yes in a way, but ultimately for you, it seems to come back to the to the fundamentals of training and nutrition, really. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Um, so on that note, I mean, um, for say any of our younger viewers or listeners out there, 
um, who've got a, a strong fire and a passion for bodybuilding and uh, uh, what kind of advice would you have for them in terms of like, do you think that they should try to max out their natural potential first and then consider turning uh, to anabolics after? Or, you know, if, if the genetics are there and the fire is there, maybe you should get started earlier and sort of see how your body responds to it. What's your thought on that? <laughs> well, I would never in good conscience tell somebody to do anabolics. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, I, um, I trained for eight years natural. I had a 500 pound squat. Uh, I was benching about 365. I had a really good foundation natural. I won a contest. Um, I, I worked really, really hard to build a really good foundation. And now that I take next to nothing, I still have a lot of muscle. And I, I believe it's because I built it the right way. I would always encourage people to train natural as long as they possibly can. You know, try different training approaches, try different nutritional approaches. Make sure you've overturned every single rock that you can before you cross that line. Um, and if you do that, I think, I mean, if you did do that and you did cross that line, I think your results at the, at the, at the in the long term would be even better. Mm. So the closer you can get to your genetic potential naturally, I think the better you would be if you did the other stuff. Right. Um, you know, but... I think, man, these guys now, they just want to jump right into it. Um, <laughs> it's like, holy cow, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I notice it a lot, especially like in just recreational users, like say people who aren't wanting to, to be on the IFBB stage. Um, they, I find that if you, and I'm not sure about this, but if you almost don't have the genetic predisposition to be a good bodybuilder, it almost just makes your physique, it can make it look worse in a way, I find. I feel like it could, it could be unrelated, but I feel like your proportions can get way out of whack in a hurry. You get all these bad side effects, and it's just like, man, you, you should just wait a couple of years first, but that's yeah. just my opinion. You know, I, I agree. And you know what's interesting is people think that the biggest abusers are the pro bodybuilders. And that's probably true now, but back in the 90s and the 2000s, it was actually the guys at the national level. It was actually the amateurs because they gave out so few pro cards that these guys were doing everything they could to get their pro card. I mean, just roasting their bodies. And many of them turned pro and then disappeared. Um, I can think of several guys that I competed against that looked phenomenal, turned pro. You know, I run into them. They're just like, man, I just couldn't handle the drugs anymore. You know, you talk, you talk to them about what they took and you're like, whoa. But um, it's a little easier to get a pro card now, so it's not quite as bad. But but back in the 90s and the 2000s, man, that to me is when the people were hitting the drugs the hardest because they were right on that cusp of being a pro. But there were so few pro cards. You just these guys were just going nuts. You know, every, I remember the first time I took growth hormone, I took two IUs uh, after I trained five days a week and I went to the USA and the guy sitting next to me is like, man, I'm not sure if I can. Um, afford his growth hormone any longer. And I was like, really? Why is that? And he's like, well, I'm taking 18 IUs a day, which was a bottle of Seristem. And I was like, you mean a week? And he's like, no, a day. It's like, man, you know, yeah. I could tell you hundreds of stories like that. <laughs> so Yeah, I mean, it must be an expensive hobby. I mean, it's got to rack up the bills. I don't know how these people pay for it. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, growth hormone, pharmaceutical growth hormone is super expensive. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so, yeah, I don't, you know, a lot of these guys, they get involved with shady stuff. And, you know, I, I don't know if you know much about my background, Jeff, but I worked as a, as a VP at Chase Bank for 12 years. Hmm. And so I had, um, I had an income outside of bodybuilding and I treated bodybuilding purely as a hobby. Obviously, I'm very passionate about it, but I didn't rely on income. Um, you know, I had a, I guess what you would call a corporate job, right? Mm -hmm. So. But a lot of guys won't do that. I mean, all the guys, you hear them, well, I can't work a real job and train too. I'm like, why not? <laughs> yeah. I don't get it. Yeah. I don't understand why you can't work a job and train, you know, even if you train two hours a day, which is a lot, yeah. I, you can still find time for that. I don't yeah. get it. People are just lazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, obviously there's a way to, to do it in a very unhealthy way and, and so that you, you can abuse it and... Uh, the steroids that is and uh, I think that this is where uh, what a lot of the the medical literature has focused on is steroid abuse um, do you think that there's a way to use it that's 
if not healthy, at least significantly less unhealthy? Or maybe you do think there is a healthy way to use to use steroids? Well, if, if you have like if you have um, if you're at the point like, you know, we know that certain hormones decline as a male gets older, you know, growth hormone and testosterone. If you're in a position where those things are low, they're not at an optimal level, then it's unhealthy. So to add the steroid in to bring you to a natural to where it should be is actually healthy. Mm-hmm. Um, really low testosterone levels is linked to a lot of different issues, including heart disease, um, depression, all kinds of things like that. But, um, you know, as far as being, there are ways to do it. And I would say lessen the risk is what I would say. I would say lessen the risk because, you know, there's things that you, there's things that I really like to track. I'll tell you some of the things I like to track insulin levels. I don't mean fasting blood glucose. I mean, true insulin levels. Um, Growth hormone can create a lot of glucose resistance. I mean, I, I know several guys who are diabetics from using growth hormone too much. If you keep an eye on your insulin levels, um, that's one thing. And also high insulin levels are linked to heart disease and just about every Alzheimer's. I mean, just about everything you can think of is linked to high insulin levels. Um, I like to look at um, C-reactive protein. Uh, just to see if your body's full of inflammation. One of the things I've seen over the years is people using all these underground drugs that aren't pharmaceutical grade. You know, their bodies, are, the, the, their CRP levels are sky high. You know, it should be one or below, and it's actually like eight or something insane like that. So I really like to watch that. Um, I mentioned blood pressure earlier. Really like to watch people's blood pressure. It's one of those things, they don't think it's a big deal, but kidney damage or things are accumulating over time, building up and building up. And when you get kidney scarring and things like that, you know, you can't, you can't, you know, there's nothing that will just remove it. Um, uh, What are the other ones I like to look for? I mean, on a lipid panel, um, all the cholesterol stuff is really debatable, but I still think it's a good idea to keep your triglycerides in your HDL in range. The other stuff's kind of debatable. Total cholesterol seems to be pretty meaningless. Um, but LDL, you know, there's the argument, that is, is it large, you know, is it fluffier molecules or small and dense or um, is it oxidized? Um, but I still think at the end of the day, it's, it's good to have high HDL and it's good to have low triglycerides. Um, but those are kind of the markers that I look at. I don't think too many people look at fasting insulin, but that would put that at the top of the list. Interesting. And how often are you recommending guys get this stuff stuff measured? Well, like twice a year. Yeah. Um, the other thing, oh, the other thing you got to watch if you're the gear geared up is um, hemoglobin, hematocrit, red blood cell count. Those things are traditionally always higher when you're taking stuff. I mean, that's what a lot of that stuff was used to treat uh, different versions of anemia, a plastic anemia, and different thing, different things like that. So um, that's another one you can fix that by donating blood. Um, donate blood twice a year, and that stuff will stay in range for the most part, and you'll never have an issue. Hmm. Um, what do you what do you think of the argument that uh, you know if, if you start out say on this like lower dose um, scheduling or what have you, um, you're always going to be tempted to want to do a little bit more because like people are kind of inherently lazy, <laughs> right? So like they they may not have to embrace your mentality quite so much. They may say, well, if, if this much is getting me this much results, then this little bit more is going to get me those little bit more results. Have you noticed that a lot in your experience, or is that just something that drug anti drug people say? Well, no, man. It's um, hey, hey, and I felt like that too. Um, you know, I used to love Winstraw. You know, I'm like, well, shoot, if 50 milligrams a day works, let me try 100. You know, <laughs> I, I'm not, I'm not immune to it. <laughs> but um, you know, eventually there is a law of diminishing returns, and I think that, um, I think that people don't aren't willing to accept it. They're just like, well, and what happens is what you mentioned earlier. They go to a certain dose, and then beyond that, it just becomes side effects. Mm. And like the sweet spot would be as much as you can with the least amount of side effects would kind of be the sweet spot, and you know, and and you know, not an impact to your blood work. You know, that would be the ideal place to be. Um, but you know, it takes experimenting. You know, I, there were certain things like I can't handle trimbolone. And there's guys out there that smash it, you know, and I couldn't handle it. Like I just one of the things I couldn't handle. So everybody's a little bit different. I could never handle some of the stuff that other people can handle. Um, but we're all a little different in that regard. 
Right. Yeah, I think that's that's true. I mean, you, you always hear about certain bodybuilders. Like I know Lee Priest was notorious for at least saying this, um, how he would take a ridiculously. I, I don't know the numbers, but it, it's it was supposed to be a really really low dose. Yeah, and he know, didn't use Strong much Beckham. complicated yeah. stuff. It was just very very simple basic stuff, and he got really huge. And then he might have even come off everything in his off season. I'm not sure, but he would still maintain like. 270 or something at like five foot five uh in his off season which is kind of crazy um do you think that that's just a, a genetic thing and and you know just like anything else some people will respond like crazy to the stuff and then others seems like they can take it and, and not get too much out of it well look at lee priest muscle bellies and right there you'll see some incredible genetics yeah look at his pictures when he was 16 years old you'll see a kid that had phenomenal genetics so there's a lot genetically going on there with him. Yeah. You know, so, you know, you look at Sean Ray when he was 16, 17, 18 years old, he looked incredible. I yeah. mean, these guys have cream of the crop genetics. Yeah. So it's not, I believe them. I believe that they don't need a whole lot to look great because I can see their genetics. Right. You know, now there's other guys, like if you told me they took a low amount, I'd say no way. You just, I just can't see the genetic genetics, you know. Right, right, so. right. I gotcha. And it, I think it's it's an important point that it's not always the case that like the biggest guy or the most impressive looking guy is the guy using the most. Would you would you agree with that? Oftentimes oh, you'd be surprised. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes you'd be surprised. Yeah. Sometimes the little guy's the one that's using the most because yeah. he doesn't want to be the little guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Right? He's tired of being the little guy, so he's yeah. cranking, you know. I I had a two twelve competitor send me a note about a month ago and he's like you know, I feel like I'm going to kill myself. The current route I'm on, and he, he showed me what his coach had him on. This guy was about 195 pounds, and he probably tripled what I've – the maximum I've taken, it was probably triple what I've taken. And I'm just like, man, I just can't believe it. I get these notes all the time from people. And, um, you know, that's the problem with coaching our industry is these guys, they don't know how to solve problems yeah. with diet, with training, and nutrition. You can solve a lot of problems with training and nutrition, but they just, you know, they just, their issue, their, their way to solve a problem is, well, we need more T3 or, well, we need more clombuterol or we need more growth hormone. There's no, you know, let's take a look at the diet. Maybe we want to do this. Maybe we want to do that. So, mm -hmm. and drugs are a powerful thing. So it works. And the people are like, oh, wow, what a great coach. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious, like, has any of this stuff left any bit of a sour taste in your mouth for bodybuilding? Or do you just realize that, like, in anything, in any endeavor, there's going to be idiots and this bodybuilding is, is no different? Or does it seem to really attract a certain type of person? <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? You know what, man? I, I don't – I'm one of those guys that people can do what they want. Yeah. I'm never – like, if you told me you take five grams of testosterone, I would say, okay. I wouldn't think any different of you. Whatever. Um, for me, man, I didn't do it. I, I did bodybuilding. I didn't do it because people picked on me or because I was trying to pick up girls. I truly loved it. Hmm. And even though I might not agree with what other people are doing, it doesn't take away my love for bodybuilding. Are there knuckleheads out there? A hundred percent. But they're in every, like you said, man, they're in everything. Yeah. You know, when I worked in the corporate world, there were jackasses that were in the corporate world. You know, um, I worked in hard manual labor jobs when I was in school. I, I ran a jackhammer. I, I worked in a wood mill. I worked in a car factory. Um, you know, there's there was, you know, people who weren't so nice. They were in all walks of life. Um, I go to church every Sunday and there's always someone that flies out of the parking lot. And you got to be careful. They don't hit you. Um, doesn't matter. I had good teachers, bad teachers. So I don't get too hung up on. You know, the sport being terrible, it's just changing. It's just turning into something a little different. It's not like it was in the 90s, but it's afforded me a really good life. And I can never be mad at the sport because it's provided me the opportunity um, to do really well for my family. Yeah. You know, I never would have been in Forbes magazine if it wasn't for bodybuilding. So there's no hard feelings in me, man. I love bodybuilding. I'll always love it. And... You know, like you said, there's always going to be knuckleheads out there. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 well said. Um, I, I, I'm just like kind of curious now. So I'm gonna have like three imaginary scenarios. So you have one person who's who's relatively new to bodybuilding and they don't have the best genetics. They want to put on a lot of muscle and they're considering um, turning to steroids. You have someone who has been bodybuilding for quite a while naturally. 
um, and is suspicious that they're approaching their, their genetic limitation. They're kind of discouraged with their training, not making a ton of progress, probably close to where they'd, they'd be maxed out um, naturally. And then you have someone who say, I don't know, in their maybe 50s or what have you, and they feel like maybe you know their, their strength and their, their shape is starting to like decline. Um, they're considering TRT. What, what would you say to those, those three different people in, in terms of just giving them advice as someone who has a lot of experience? The TRT guy, okay, the first thing I would say is what's your total testosterone, what's your free testosterone? I would want to see blood work. Yeah. If his total testosterone was 150, I'd say, whoo, we got a problem. You need to get some medication in you. Um, I don't look at someone to make a guess. I don't go by how, how they're feeling, although those things can give you vital information. Um, you still want to see some lab work. Yeah. You know, you can't ignore that. And I personally would like to see lab work in all three of those scenarios to see where someone's at. I mean, knowledge is power. The more you know about – I have a really high free test level, um, which is a great genetic gift. That means that I can use stuff better than most people, and that's probably one of the reasons why I can get away with less. But I would never know that if I didn't get blood work done so frequently. Um, Say the second guy was approaching his genetic potential, you said? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you got. I, I, so I start with I start with all the life stuff first, Jeff. It's like, okay, do you have a? Are you married? You have a spouse. What would she think? I'm not going to tell you to do something if your wife disagrees with me. Do you have kids? What would your kids think? Um, you know, are you? I, I like people like they get into this thing where it's just their own life and they can't see out. And this is bodybuilding, man. This is how bodybuilding is. People are very selfish. It's a very selfish sport and you can get lost in it and you for, you can forget about the people around you. I mean, I've seen so many broken relationships and bodybuilding more than I can count. And it comes down to selfishness. It's a selfish sport, but it doesn't have to be. So I'm always talking to people like, tell me, okay, if you want to make this step, how's this going to impact your family? What's your wife going to think about it? You got to, you got to ask those kinds of things. Right. Cause maybe this guy's all gung ho and he does it. And then maybe his wife is like, I wanted to have kids. You know, how's this going to impact us having kids? So if I told that guy to go for it and his wife wanted to have kids and I just told him to do something that might reduce his chance of having kids, I'm a pretty shitty person, I think. So, you know, I, I try to understand people's lives, what's going on in their lives. Um, I don't coach a ton of people anymore, you know, um, but the ones I do, it's like a family. And that's kind of the relationships I like to have with the people I work with. Um, and these are the kinds of conversations I have with them, like you and I are having. Yeah. You know, if someone says, "Hey, what do you think, man? I, I'm not even. I'm, I'm at my genetic potential. Should I take gear?" I won't even get into that until I understand the d- dynamic of their life a little better. Right. You know, if it's a dude right. in an apartment, it's just him, and he doesn't care, and it's the only thing he has in his life, then hey, man, go for it, dude. If that's what you want to do, go for it. But so I, I guess my answer jeff is you know you it's always good to have data it's always good to know where someone's blood work is but you also got to know what's going on in the person's life personally what if it's a person who has an addictive personality and you're telling them to do that is that a good move probably not you know what if it's someone where they tell you they're close to their genetic potential but but you know they don't train hard they don't eat right Hmm. is that the kind of person you want to tell them to take drugs probably not there's probably things they should fix first so you got to really do some inspection when you answer questions like that, you know, yeah. so that you're given a well-informed answer. I got you. See you. what I'm saying? Yeah, of course, of course. Um, and then I guess for the, let's say this is the young guy, he's 19 years old and he's kind of just frustrated and wants to make some, some quick gains. What, uh, what would you advise him? <laughs> Probably eat more. Eat more. Um, <laughs> when you're, when you're younger, man, you burn stuff up. Uh, my grandmother raised me and she worked in a restaurant. She was a cook in a restaurant and she brought me home a cherry pie every night. And when I was trying to gain weight before I went to bed, I ate a whole cherry pie every night for a <laughs> long time. And I mean, <laughs> the golden you know, days, <laughs> sometimes it's hard as hell to gain weight. Yeah. You know, um, I remember when I wrestled, I would get home and my mom would make a tray of cornbread and I would have a giant bowl of whole milk and I would throw the cornbread in it, it like mush. And I would eat the whole tray of cornbread you know, but, um, I was trying really hard to gain weight and it didn't really work until I hit about 20 years old. And then all of a sudden I, you know, 15, 20 pounds. Um, 
you know, from eating. But most of those young guys, man, they just got to eat more. Yeah. You know? So, John, I've got two more questions for you, and then we'll call it a wrap. This was a really interesting conversation for me. Um, so we talked a lot about genetics. Um, I'm curious, what do you think about this? Do you think that genetics tend to trump hard work, or can you really outwork or yeah, outwork bad genetics and be successful as a bodybuilder? Well, I mean, ultimately, the guys who do the best have both, right? They have yeah. great genetics and they work hard. But I've seen a lot of genetic freaks in my day that can never get in shape. They can never fulfill their potential. And then you have guys like me. Um, if you look at my structure, I have narrow clavicles. I have a wide pelvic girdle. I have a high pelvic crest. I have uh, I have um, high lats. Um, you know, those are traits that you would say there's no way this guy can be a pro, let alone play some pro shows. But I've overcome that. And I like to think I did that with smart, smart training. Um so I think, I think there has to be a certain level of genetics, though, to hit that. You can't just take anybody and make them a pro. I think that's giving people false hope. There's a lot of people that I worked with that were great people. But no matter what they did, no matter what drug they took, they're just not going to be a pro. It just genetically is not in the cards for them. Um, so there's like a minimum level of genetics I think you have to have. And there's so much that goes into that. Um, but I have, like I said, man, I have seen a lot of guys with absolutely sick genetics, man, just never take advantage of it. Just lazy and a lot of them. And I beat a lot of those guys, yeah. you know, but, you know, but then the guys come along who do both and they crush me. So, right. yeah, yeah, I, I, it's, it's similar to any sport, I suppose, you know, there's always going to be that interplay between discipline and, and genetics. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. I mean, I'm a huge football fan. I mean. You know, you look at Jerry Rice, the guy who was gifted, he was fast, he ran perfect routes, and he worked hard. He was one of the hardest workers in the NFL history. And then you get guys like Des Bryant, supreme, had a gift, runs bad routes, you know, doesn't really work real hard. And, he, you know, you, you're right. You see that in all sports. Yeah, yeah. Um, so something I think that can apply to, to really anyone who has an interest in, in bodybuilding or even just building a, a more impressive physique is uh, the idea of weak points. It's like some muscles, and it's different for everyone, just really seem to be really stubborn and not grow no matter what. Um, a lot of guys come to me uh, with calf issues in this regard, but you know, I think for me it's probably my biceps and my traps more than anything. Um, what would you say, uh, just general advice for, for weak point uh, prioritization or improving those? Well, I mean, again, I think you got to look at exercise execution. And I'm going to give you an example. You mentioned calves. Um, I've built up 20 inch calves. They're not like that now, but at one, but two or three years ago, they were 20 inches and everybody, all oh, your calves are, your genetics are off the chain. Like actually my genetics are pretty weak with calves, but I figured out how to train them, you, you know, and it's really logical when you think about it. I've been telling people for years, you have to work out of the stretch. Everybody gets on these calf machines and they just work the top half, yeah. you know, oh, just get up and flex and do sets of 25, all oh, it's fast twitch, it's, it's uh, slow twitch muscle fiber, maybe your soul is, but, um, but they don't really emphasize the stretch. And that's what your calves aren't used to. They're not used to coming out of a stretch position with heavy weight. So the first thing I tell people is, okay, I want you to stretch, I want you to pause in the stretch, and I want you to use progressive overload and try to build it up until you're using a whole stack. Um, there's things like that. So that's an example of people give up on their calves when the reality is I don't even think they've trained them correctly. So I'm going to try to get them to train them correctly. First of all, biceps, the biggest thing with biceps is people just train them too heavy. A lot of times, you know, um, maybe there's too much lower back or shoulders when they curl, you know, maybe there's, maybe there's not enough full range of motion. You know, maybe they're just, their joint angle is so narrow. They're not really elongating the muscle. So I guess I'm really be big Jeff and I got to see how exercise execution is and that's step one for me and if that and if that's good if all that stuff proves right then I look at how can we increase frequency so how can we increase because maybe they're not training maybe they're training they're getting a nice little uh, good effect and then they're waiting too long and it's about bottoming out they're kind of starting over so maybe you can instead of waiting five days now maybe you can wait two or three days, give yourself the 48 hours that's customary um, and increase frequency. That's an approach I like to use. 
Here's the thing with frequency, though. When I have someone, let's say they have bad legs, and I increase their leg frequency, you you don't have an unlimited amount of recovery. So you've got to you've got to give up something somewhere. So I'll take someone's strong body parts. Let's say it's their back, and I'll bring their work sets way down, hmm. and I'll I'll make up for the sets on their weak body part. So you can't just mindlessly add volume to people's routines. And I see people do that a lot. They'll take their straight routine that they're doing and then they'll just keep adding volume, but then you can't recover. Yeah. If you could, then we could just train our whole body every single day. Yeah. You know, it just doesn't work that way. So, but if we can give your body a little bit more recovery capacity and then maybe we can hit it more frequently. So if you're getting 10 workouts in 30 days as opposed to four, now you've got it. Now maybe chronically, um, maybe you can get more muscle tissue over the year. Right. Yeah, I think I think that's that's great advice right there. I need to I need to apply that for my biceps. <laughs> Doing everything days, man. Yeah. <laughs> right on. Um, so John, that's all I, all I had for you. We're going on a, just over an hour here now, but it was it was an awesome conversation, man. I think I think the people are really gonna gonna enjoy it. It's something different, something that I've never really talked about on the channel, especially the stuff to do with with steroids. Some of the differences there. Some of your training techniques, I think, are really really novel, even for for me to hear. So I think it's it's really interesting. I appreciate it, man. You're doing awesome work, and uh, I appreciate you having me on. I know I'm not the typical PhD, so. <laughs> no, it's awesome. I love I love talking to people who just have tons of experience in bodybuilding because, like, you're, you're like you know you can tell you like you're you're your own scientist and you're not dogmatic. You're not stuck in your ways, like you said. And, and this is the way I see it myself. It's like people will often say, "Oh, you're just like picking studies to support your point of view." And I'm just like, "Why would I do that? Like, I'm trying to figure out what is going to work the best. I right. don't I don't care about defending right. my own view. If it turns out that I'm wrong tomorrow, I'll." I'll be the first to, to admit it. I'm just trying to figure out what works best. Um, yeah. So anyway, I, I respect that you seem to have the same basic idea there. Yep, 100%. Um, but yeah, so to everybody listening, um, make sure you go and check out John's YouTube channel. Uh, he's putting out a ton of really cool content there. I'll have it linked uh, in the description down below. I think you guys will find it helpful. A lot of different tweaks and cues on certain exercises you probably won't see anywhere else. And uh, we're here recording this late on a Friday night, so make sure you give us some love and hit the hit the thumbs up button if you enjoyed it. Uh, make sure you, you say thanks to John. Uh, like I said, I'll have everything linked down there in the description. Um, thank you guys for watching. Uh, if you are new by any chance, uh, you can hit the subscribe button. I'm going to be doing interviews like this uh, at least once once a month moving forward uh, in 2018. That's something that uh, I've wanted to sort of introduce to the channel again. Um, so yeah, thanks for watching, guys. Thanks again, John. And we'll see you all next time.